Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, a year since civil war broke out in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, we talk to experts about the worsening humanitarian situation there. We have uh, virtually uh, every need you can think of. Severe malnutrition rates. Most health centers have been uh, trashed. And I speak with a researcher who found that reusable food containers aren't always better for the environment than disposable ones. For climate change, just cleaning the reusable container has more impact. I'm Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware in London. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. The past few weeks have seen a serious escalation of the ongoing civil war in Ethiopia. Ethiopian government forces have launched new airstrikes on the capital of the Tigray region. What began a year ago as a conflict in the Tigray region of northern Ethiopia has now spread to the neighboring regions of Amhara and Afar. The Tigray War began on the night of November 4th, 2020. That was when the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, the TPLF, launched an attack on the northern command of the Ethiopian army in Mekele, the capital of Tigray. In Ethiopia, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmad has ordered a military offensive against the regional Tigray government in response to the attack on an army base. This was in part a response to a decision by the Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, to politically exclude Tigrayans from the leading coalition. This angered the Tigrayan leadership, who dominated Ethiopian politics for almost three decades. The Tigrayan rebellion against the federal government which followed was met with brutal force by the Ethiopian army. In late June, Ethiopian forces announced a unilateral ceasefire, but it didn't hold. Tigrayan forces remained in control of the region, and attempts to mediate have thus far proved unsuccessful. The year-long conflict has involved a number of other armed groups, including forces from neighbouring Eritrea fighting on the side of the Ethiopian government. This week, a joint investigation by the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and the UN Human Rights Office said that all sides had violated human rights in the war and that war crimes may have been committed. In recent days, Tigrayan forces have made further territorial gains. Rebellious Tigrayan forces say they have seized the strategic town of Desi in Ethiopia's Amhara region, where thousands of ethnic Amharas have sought refuge from escalating violence. On November the 2nd, the Ethiopian government declared a state of emergency amid reports that Tigrayan forces may consider marching on the capital, Addis Ababa. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has asked all Ethiopians to mobilise and fight back against the rebels. Tigray is under an ongoing blockade and community Communications blackout. Aid deliveries are struggling to get through, and the food situation is critical. In this episode, we've collaborated with our colleagues at The Conversation in Africa, who make the Pasha podcast. One of Pasha's hosts, Godfred Baufo, who's based in Accra in Ghana, called up a researcher who's been studying the food situation in Tigray. Before we begin, Emnet, please can you introduce yourself to our listeners? My name is uh, Emnet Nagash. I'm currently a PhD student at Ghent University here in Belgium. And I am also an assistant professor at uh, Makale University in Tigray. And before then, I have been working for Tigray Bureau of Agriculture and Rural Development. And my research interest is basically on the climate, hydrology and uh, the farming systems. And uh, I'm currently also involved in monitoring the, the humanitarian catastrophes in Tigray together with my colleagues here at Ghent University and back home at Makale University as well. And you're originally from Tigray? Yes, I am originally from Tigray and I left Tigray in uh, October 2020. That's a month before the war started. Can you describe the landscape in Tigray to a person who has never been there? Tigray is a mountainous area located in the northern Ethiopia that's uh, quite close to the Red Sea. We have a lot of ups and downs and the land is uh, fragmented with a land holding size of uh, not more than one hectare per household. And nowadays it would even go be less than that. The topographic variability allows the farmers to grow diversified crops, including uh, maize, teff, barley, wheat, millet, and several other crops and very much diversified uh, farming systems, which is basically subsistence in the highland areas with cash crop in the western and northwestern part, and you have uh, commercial farming. And is it very dry there? Well, I would call it an arid and semi-arid environment. It's a bit dry and 
But then uh, the farmers know how to manage their lands and how to survive. They have this indigenous knowledge. They have been practicing this subsistence agriculture for the last uh, 3,000 years. So what was the situation for farmers like before the war began? Before the war began, um, there have been semi-blockade kind of thing from the Ethiopian government side. So Ethiopia is in a federal government setup, and the regions, they receive rations of uh, budget from the federal government. And uh, Tigray as a region was denied um, the budget for last year. And uh, that was already a blockade. And there were uh, restrictions in travel for investment and all that. That was a semi-blockade. And then there was the desert locusts. Ethiopia has been tackling its invasion of locusts for months. Now the United Nations says the problem has got so bad. It's the worst it's been here for 25 years. Which uh, later destroyed about 25 to 30 percent of the crop production from last year. We needed chemicals and instruments to, to fight against this, uh, this locust infestation. And these instruments and the chemicals were prevented from entering Tigray. Okay, so tell us what research you and your colleagues have been doing since the conflict in Tigray started a year ago. So the team of us here at Ghent University, we are trying to monitor the humanitarian situation in Tigray since the war started. And uh, so far we have about four and five publications, uh, including the Tigray Atlas of the Humanitarian Situation, where we have about uh, 25 maps showing different circumstances in Tigray, from the farming systems, the landscape itself, the civilian atrocities, the territorial control, and then and, and the aid blockade. And we also have um, separate papers covering on how the war affected uh, the farming systems. And what are some of the findings of your research? So uh, normally, on average, we have uh, 100 days of uh, growing period, extending from June to September. And But the war has delayed uh, the start of uh, the growing period, and farmers were not able to plow their lands before June. And they only started at the end of uh, June and starting of July. And they were not able to plant crops that were supposed to be planted before then, which includes maize, which is a lean season crop that matures early and uh, they would uh, eat early in September. We could see that it was largely delayed and that farmers were uh, prevented from accessing their farmlands. We could see that from satellite image, and um, but we could also verify that uh, based on telephone interviews with key informants from several parts of Tigray. We also looked into how the land is prepared and how the crops are progressing later in August. And our finding is that about 20 to 30 percent of the land was left fallow, which is literally means the land remains uh, unplowed. And if you compare it to previous years, the fallow size was uh, only limited to only 5%. So the farmers are um, not able to plow their lands mainly because uh, they were either uh, denied access to their land or maybe that their farm equipments and their oxen were either killed or looted or maybe the farmer himself has been killed. And the other frightening finding we have is that uh, only 20 to 50 percent of the land is expected to produce a reasonable yield, which literally means 50 to 80 percent of the land is uh, not producing almost anything, which is quite frightening. What other challenges do farmers have to get enough food to eat? This year, it's not only that uh, the war has affected the farming systems and they were prevented access to their farmlands, but then again, we have uh, this desert locust coming up and we are uh, expecting only 20 to 50 percent of the land to produce reasonable crops. And this 20 to 50 percent is again being threatened by the desert uh, uh, swarms that are already in the ground and also expected to increase in their uh, infestation in the coming days and months. And we also have the blockade again. About 100 trucks of uh, food aid are, was expected to reach Tigray, but then this is not happening. Emnet, let me just ask this. With the situation that you've described, 
uh, for us. How difficult is it to find out what's really going on? It's difficult to discover what is happening there. Uh, what we have documented so far is uh, a tip of the iceberg. The blockade is not only the humanitarian blockade, but also interruption of uh, public services. There is no media, there is no telephone, there is no internet, there is no electricity, the, and transportation is also not possible. We don't even know if our families are alive. From where you sit with the limited information, can you say whether they are experiencing famine? The UN and also the USAID has already estimated that uh, about 400,000 up to 900,000 people are already experiencing famine, which literally means about uh, 425 and 1,200 uh, people are already estimated to be dying from starvation. But if you look from the ground, we hear again reports of 150 and 200 people dying uh, in each locality. Famine is, does not only directly kill you, but uh, it also increases uh, the chance of people dying from simple sickness. And uh, you can imagine the number of children mainly uh, dying from uh, diseases like diarrhea, the healthcare facilities has been largely destroyed and people are easily exposed to die from uh, simple sickness and this uh, increased the death toll uh, in addition to the to the famine as well what do you think may happen next then unless this blockade is uh, ended the farmers has been trying their best to manage their land and so far, with the ongoing farming situation, they have been eating any leaves possible. They have the indigenous knowledge to, to identify which leaves can be eaten and cannot be. But now, the rainy season has ended and it's the dry season has started already in Tigray. And that uh, I am afraid that there will not be any possible leaves remaining for the farmers or for, for the people to eat. And that's really frightening. And this, what I'm mentioning, is about the rural population. And if you come to the urban areas where we have uh, the population basically reliant on uh, non-farming activities, and people have not been receiving salaries since the war started for some cases, and if they even have had uh, savings and the banks are closed and they don't access their money in the bank. And so uh, people are without salaries and they cannot pay their house rents, and they cannot buy food. So you can imagine life of these people unless this blockade is ended in one or, or another way. This famine is going to be in another level, and there are not going to be any leaves to be eaten available anymore in the future. Amna, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your thoughts on the situation in Tigray. Thank you very much. It's, it's my pleasure to share my thoughts. The work that Emnet and his colleagues are doing to track the food situation in Tigray paints a deeply worrying picture of what's to come in a region where famine is already killing people. So how is the rest of the world reacting to the unfolding catastrophe in northern Ethiopia? To find out and to understand more about the challenges to achieving peace, I called up a veteran humanitarian expert. I'm Mukesh Kapila. I'm the Professor Emeritus of Global Health and Humanitarian Affairs at the University of uh, Manchester. But uh, more significantly, I have worked for many years uh, in a senior positions in the United Nations and uh, in the International Red Cross. I'm very experienced in African uh, matters. I was the head of the uh, UN in uh, Sudan and worked in many other situations of conflict and crisis and humanitarian catastrophe. Could you paint us a picture of what the humanitarian situation is like today, not just in Tigray, but in the neighbouring provinces of Amhara and Afar as well? In my 30 years of experience in uh, complex emergency settings, this is one of the most vicious conflicts that I have come across. And the humanitarian situation as prevailing in Ethiopia, including Tigray and surrounding regions, is uh, a reflection of that. So we have somewhere in the region of uh, about uh, 7 million people in need, 
uh, at least 5 billion in Tigray and uh, at least a couple of million in the neighboring regions of Amara and Afar. We have uh, refugees in neighboring Sudan approaching uh, 100,000. And within Tigray, we have uh, virtually uh, every need you can think of. Aid agencies are raising concerns that civilians are dying from a lack of health care services, while survivors face food and water shortages. Severe malnutrition rates are extremely high at over 2%. Most health centers have been uh, trashed. And uh, the supply of essential medicines has uh, gone down to zero. There are no immunization programs taking place. So never mind COVID-19, uh, even basic conditions like polio and so on, the uh, vaccination rates have really plunged, uh, thereby uh, sowing in the seeds of a future public health uh, uh, crisis. At the same time, uh, we also have had a huge amounts of sexual violence committed as part of the war. There are disturbing reports about war crimes and other atrocities happening in Tigray. The UN says women have been the target of systematic rape and sexual violence from all warring parties. Especially in the first uh, six months or so. And that has meant that tens of thousands uh, of women have been uh, brutally raped and have not received assistance that they should. Uh, and the legacy of that in terms of both physical and mental health impacts, of course, is going to go on for uh, generations. We have a degradation of the water and sanitation system. And this has not been helped by the fact that every single form of humanitarian obstruction you can think of, and that I have seen in places around the world only in phases, is now prevalent on a systematic basis uh, throughout uh, Tigray for the last several months. Thus, uh, United Nations agencies and other humanitarian organizations are unable to get in. Once they get in, it's not a problem because humanitarian access is available within Tigray region now. Uh, now that the Tigray Defense Forces are essentially in control of the security uh, situation. But their ability to actually take in essential fuel, for example, for generators for hospitals or uh, for the distribution logistics in terms of getting food and uh, nutrition supplies out to the scattered infrastructure of this difficult-to-reach terrain in the best of circumstances has been severely compromised. With humanitarian workers themselves also being attacked uh, and expelled, the capacity of the system has been degraded considerably in the past weeks. And is the main underlying cause of that a blockade on humanitarian aid getting into Tigray? Yes, I think uh, humanitarian access is always a problem in all conflicts. I've seen it uh, in many, many situations. But what uh, is unique about the Tigray-Ethiopia situation is that all the tactics which underlie violations of international humanitarian law are being violated. So, for example, by systematically embargoing the transport of food and essential medical supplies uh, into the territory uh, have meant that there is a sort of blanket punishment of the population. And that is a flagrant violation because whatever the disputes between the Tigray authorities and the Addis authorities, uh, wars have their limits. And there are certain rules of war that uh, outlaw uh, deliberate targeting of vulnerable civilians uh, and uh, such like. And those have been uh, violated. Outside of the Tigray region, there have also been reports of ethnic Tigrayans being forcibly detained, disappeared and, and actually displaced as well across e Ethiopia, put, put in camps, for example. Um, what do you make of, of those reports, considering your own experience elsewhere? In fact, uh, the war is not just being conducted in Tigray. The war is being conducted all over Ethiopia in terms of the targeting of people according to their ethnicity, in this case, uh, Tigrayans. What that means is there are many credible reports of disappearances of Tigrayans 
as well as summary executions, for example, of Tigrayan uh, prisons of war, and of uh, removing Tigrayans from uh, uh, positions in Ethiopian society, thus degrading their means of livelihood. And indeed, thousands of Tigrayans have disappeared to places that we don't know much about. Human Rights Watch has issued a report saying that Ethiopian authorities since late June 2021 have arbitrarily detained, forcibly disappeared and committed other abuses against ethnic Tigrayans in Ethiopia's capital. Now, my experience of uh, other cases is that uh, this uh, happens when the side committing the primary aggression is uh, feeling that the direct military approach with uh, soldiers going against uh, the opposition are not working, then collateral techniques are employed, uh, forms of terror. I think Ethiopians must realize that this is a war not just uh, on Tigray, off Tigray, and, uh, and about Tigray. It is a conflict that is enveloping Everyone in the country and everyone, unfortunately, will have to pay the price or is paying the price of this uh, extraordinary decisions by the government in Addis to implode uh, its own country. In the last few weeks, the fighting has escalated even further. The UN actually had to abort a humanitarian aid flight. The Ethiopian government launched an airstrike on the capital of the northern Tigray region. The strikes forced a United Nations humanitarian flight to abandon its landing in the capital. So can you tell us how difficult it's been for the UN um, to continue its operations? Uh, Well, it's a complex situation for the UN, undoubtedly. But... Several of the problems that the UN is facing, it has brought on itself. Its in-country leadership has been extremely poor, and it has been accused of taking sides. The standard accusation from the government in Addis is that the humanitarian agencies are partisan, that their aid is there to help the TPLF, and that, uh, therefore, they have to impose restrictions and control what goes into Tigray. I'm sure much of those accusations by the government in Addis is uh, politically motivated to undermine the UN. But the fact that the officials of the UN sitting in Addis have got themselves into a position where they're being kicked around like a, like a football and kicked out, is a reflection of the poor quality of the leadership, both in Addis of the UN system, as well as of the ultimate UN leadership of Antonio Guterres in New York. So while uh, I'm a great supporter and I'm a former UN uh, resident and humanitarian coordinator in neighboring Sudan, which is going through huge problems uh, at the present time, I have very little sympathy with the situation that UN has got themselves into. What needs to happen, I think, is much stronger leadership from New York, plus possibly the appointment of a special representative of the Secretary General at a higher level to try and bring order within the UN UN system. And this is not helped by the African Union, where, as you know, um, basically uh, what is coming out of the African Union is nothing. And because it is one of the uh, the mechanisms of the way the international community work, that uh, we turn to regional organizations to very often take the lead first in solving problems in their own uh, area. So the UN has been hiding behind the AU, and the AU, of course, has been hiding behind the government in Addis. Well, it doesn't help that the African Union is uh, headquarters are actually located in Addis, where, to all intents and purposes, they are a hostage. What about other humanitarian agencies other than the UN? As far as the other humanitarian agencies are concerned, we don't have enough uh, transparency. So if you look, for example, at the social media outputs of some uh, humanitarian organizations, they talk about uh, relief to northern uh, Ethiopia. Now, northern Ethiopia, which is uh, a loaded term at the best of circumstances, obscures, therefore, whether or not the assistance is taking place in Tigray or in Afar, or in Amara, or in other parts of the country. And I think this is 
possibly because the humanitarian uh, organizations are uh, on tenterhooks. They don't want to say anything that will displace uh, the Addis government, which will uh, perhaps uh, mean that they might get kicked out, you see. You've described a very dangerous, deadly, very difficult political situation. Where do you think the solution lies? The solution to this crisis is not going to come from outside because the outside is paralyzed for both regional reasons, the position of Ethiopia in East Africa, the position of Ethiopia within regional institutions such as uh, the African Union, and it's not going to uh, have any solutions from the international side because of geopolitical factors, China, India, and so on. And the sooner that is realized, and the sooner Ethiopians of all distinctions uh, and all sides, uh, including uh, Tigrayans and uh, Afars and Amaras and others, realize that the solution only lies in their own hands, the better it will be. I think here where uh, some experience of history comes in, unfortunately, conflicts never end until one side or other has won or they have mutually paralyzed themselves. And therefore, what we're seeing on the ground is trying to change facts on the ground, uh, one way or the other, which might lead to a situation where the two sides uh, will uh, have to negotiate. At the moment, there are no incentives to uh, negotiate. In fact, there are counter incentives in terms of rhetoric being used, especially from the government side, in terms of the uh, all-out war that is being waged. When you wage a total war, you're waging a war of annihilation. That's why uh, many people, including myself, call the conflict a genocidal conflict. And uh, uh, my determination, being a veteran of genocides, such as in Darfur, in Srebrenica, in Rwanda, in Cambodia, and I've been to all those places directly, experienced them. One thing is clear, that when you have a genocidal situation and a genocidal war of attrition being fought, then there is no peaceful resolution to a genocide. A genocide is only resolved through the use of force. The use of force can come from outside or it can come from inside. The use of force from outside, as for example, when NATO intervened in, uh, in Bosnia, uh, or we had uh, UN peacekeepers in uh, Darfur. That's not going to happen. And therefore, the only thing that's left then is internal use of force. And this is what we're seeing at the moment to see which side is going to win. When you say internal force, what do you mean by that in the context of, of Tigray and, and Ethiopia? So uh, when the uh, war started a year ago, it rapidly got more and more inhumane. So as happened in the Darfur genocide, the worst of the Tigray genocide happened in the first three, four months. And then the Tigrayan uh, defense forces uh, came back to protect their people. So the Tigrayan military created essentially a safe haven in their own geographical uh, area. So what's going on in, in Tigray now is still genocidal violence, but the whole action of genocide, which marked the first few months of the crisis, that's been halted uh, because of the uh, Tigrayan forces. My prediction is that because success in a war is determined not just by your military might, but also the motivation uh, of the cause that powers the dispute, Ethiopia is going to have huge problems imposing a military solution on uh, Tigray. This is just not going to happen, partly because of the physical terrain, partly because Ethiopia's military capabilities are not that good. And uh, thirdly, I think uh, the Tigrayan people who are confronting an existentialist threat, and therefore they've got nothing to lose other than to fight back with everything at their disposal. What other options do you think that the government had? It was the TPLF who first attacked the Northern Command at the beginning of November um, 2020. Yes, uh, the Tigrayans uh, may have attacked the Ethiopian uh, army and uh, it was perfectly legitimate for the Ethiopian armed forces and the government to strike back. 
I am not against the war, and I am not saying that the war is never uh, justified. But I am saying is that in the way the Ethiopian government uh, responded to the war, they just added fuel to fire instead of the legitimate military action they could have taken to control uh, what at that time was considered a, a rebel um, uh, activity from the Tigrayan side. Now, the international response at the moment from the West, from the US, from the EU, is to threaten sanctions against both sides. So I wonder what you think about that approach. Yes, sanctions are something that can uh, should happen against uh, Addis. And uh, very definitely, they should be imposed sooner or later, because in the end, all wars are fought with dollars. And sooner or later, when the dollars run out, the war-making uh, capacity deteriorates. Now, if you're saying should the sanctions be also imposed uh, on the TPLF, uh, then uh, I would say that I suppose you could uh, do that as part of a strategy, which is to try and reduce the war-making machinery on all sides. But the impact of the sanctions are going to be disproportionate because the Ethiopian side, meaning the Addis side, has got more resilience and capacity. In any case, the sanctions that Western powers uh, impose, like the US, important as they will be, fundamentally will be undone by the support that the government uh, of uh, Abiy Ahmed is receiving from its allies. For example, uh, China. Well, I don't think that's going to happen much of that on the case of the other side. So yes, If the governments of uh, uh, liberal democracies around the uh, West wish to help Ethiopia and the government in Addis complete the job of genocide in Tigray, yes, they can uh, impose uh, sanctions on uh, all sides, thereby relatively empowering the Addis side to finish its job. Thank you so much for your time, Mukesh. It's been a pleasure talking with you and we appreciate your expertise. So thank you. Thank you. I hope our conversation helps to enlighten people around the world. You can read more analysis of the situation in Ethiopia, marking a year since the Tigray war begun, on the conversation. We'll put some links to that in our show notes. And you can hear more from Godfred and his colleagues by searching for Pasha wherever you get your podcasts. For our second story this week, we're talking to a researcher who studies the environmental impact of plastic food containers. Like Tupperware. Yes, Tupperware is definitely part of it. But more specifically, for this study, he looked at the differences between reusable or single-use takeout food containers. He's been analyzing how many times you actually have to reuse a container for it to be more eco-friendly than a single-use container like styrofoam. And the results are actually kind of surprising. I'm uh, Dr. Alejandro Gallego-Smith. I'm a senior lecturer in circular economy and life cycle sustainability assessment at the Tyndall Center, which is part of the University of Manchester in the UK. Can you describe why any container is bad for the environment? What are the kind of like costs that go into producing one or getting rid of one or, you know? We have to be aware that everything that we do has an environmental impact. It's not about if a product is intrinsically bad or not is the way that we use them, you know, and that applies in general to plastics. Plastic is a wonderful material. The problem is is when we don't use it correctly. That's all well and good, but certainly a lot of this stuff gets used incorrectly. And part of your research is trying out to figure out how to solve this problem. So um, what is the basic question you wanted to answer with your recent paper? Uh, First of all, we analyzed the three most common single-use containers that are used in takeaway restaurants. The first one is the polystyrene, which people normally call, it's incorrect, but people call it styrofoam. The other one is uh, polypropylene, which is the typical, this is transparent, okay, a plastic one that also we get with some, some food. And the other one is aluminum that is normally used for, for example, for rice in Chinese restaurants, okay? So we select those ones because uh, those are the ones that are most commonly used. And just to, to put it into context, there are between 500 and 
850 million of these single-use containers are used only in the European Union every year. So we wanted to know which of these ones was the best from the environmental perspective. And the other big question that we want to answer, we saw, for example, in the internet that there was a lot of people saying, bring your own Tupperware. So the other big question that we want to answer was, uh, how many times do you have to reuse that container to counteract the impact of the single-use containers? What aspects of an object's life cycle did you consider? So we consider all the stages of the life cycle of the product. For example, if we are talking about plastic, plastic comes from oil, okay? So we are considering, for example, the extraction of that oil and all the impacts associated to that, okay? Once that we have the raw materials, we have also the transformation of those raw materials. How from that oil we obtain the plastic, how we give to the plastic the shape that uh, we want, and for that you are consuming energy, you are consuming electricity and heat. Then once that you have your single-use container, for example, you have to transport it, okay? So you have, for example, the use of uh, trucks to transport that to the place where you buy it, okay? Then we have the, the use stage, which in the case of the reusable container, you have to use to consider the cleaning of the reusable container and uh, finally, the last part is the end of life. Okay, so again, we have a transport from where you deposit your uh, single-use or reusable container, where it goes to a place where it's treated, and we consider different percentage of incineration, landfilling, and recycling. So what did you find? What was the worst? What was the best? And how many times do we got to reuse my Tupperware until I'm saving the planet? First of all, we compare the three single-use containers. The styrofoam, you know, the, the polystyrene, was the best in all the impact categories. And that's not something that normally happens, you know, because normally there is one that is better for one impact category, but it's not very common that is the best in all the impact categories. Why is the reason for that? First of all, uh, polystyrene is not very heavy. You know, we are using only seven grams of material per container. In the case of the polypropylene, it's much heavier. You need more uh, energy, more materials to produce a container, and that affects the total impacts. And if we compare the polystyrene with the aluminium, aluminium is quite light as well. We are talking about a similar mass, but to produce aluminium, you need much more energy, and that penalizes the aluminium container. And what about reusing Tupperware containers? What did you find there? When we compare the Tupperware-style container, how many times do we have to use it? We compare it with the, with the styrofoam, which was the best one from the single-use containers. So we uh, saw that the impact category that you have to reuse less time to counteract was air pollution. Okay, You have to use it 16 times. For climate change, you have to reduce your container 18 times. For the consumption of resources, which is very important for circular economy, you have to use it 208 times. And there were actually one impact category that you can never counteract, which was terrestrial ecotoxicity. So it's the contamination of the soils. The reason for that is because just cleaning the reusable has more impact for terrestrial ecotoxicity than producing a single-use uh, container of styrofoam or polystyrene. 16 uses, I can do that. 208, maybe, if it's a container I use every day. But essentially what you're saying is that no matter how many times you reuse your container, you'll always be releasing some kinds of toxins into the environment just by washing it. So what do you think the answer is here? I think we have to go for options that make life easier for the user. There are schemes that are starting to be developed, you know, where a lot of restaurants are involved that are using reusables and you can return 
your container, not only in the place where you got it, but in any restaurant that is part of the, of the scheme, these kind of things. And in this case, probably that reusable container is going to be used more than 200 times, 300 times or 400 times. But I think it's only when we go for this type of schemes where a lot of restaurants are involved, where it's easier for the user to return that reusable container is when things are really, really working. We have to start to think if we want to solve all this problem with plastics, we have to design things for the user in order that it's easier for the user to like participate. I normally think that people have good intentions and if you put things easy to them, they are going to do the right thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like if I'm going to make a choice, given the world that exists, I have to ask myself, am I really going to use that reusable container that I'm about to buy for $10? Because if not, it's worse for the environment. I might feel good at the time, but it might not be. Or if I am going to put it to use, then go for it. Is that kind of the first part is like double check yourself? <laughs> yeah. I, and I think Dan, that in this case, if you're going to use a, re, a buy a reusable container to take your lunch for, for work, you know, I think it makes totally sense. And I do it myself. I, I have a reusable container. I don't think that it makes sense to go with a styrofoam every day, you know, with a single one to take your food for lunch. Okay. In takeaway restaurants, it's much more complicated. You're just going to go to grab a burger and maybe you are not taking your own reusable container with you everywhere. Yeah. And that perfectly leads to the next point in where I think I want to end this conversation is you talked about how we need to make it easier for the consumer. And in the environmental circles, and a lot of people talk about how the responsibility is placed on you and me making the right choice versus the system changing to make it easier for us to make the right choice. And is that kind of where this research led you to finish up? Like, is that kind of the big takeaway really at the end here? I think that the big takeaway is that if companies put plastic in the market, you know, they have to take the responsibility that that plastic is recycled. And if, if we are talking about developing countries, they have to help to develop the waste treatment facilities that are uh, necessary. At the end of life, if you don't have in your municipalities an industrial composting facility, that container is going to end in a landfill and it's not going to be biodegradable. You know, it's not going to disappear, okay? So it's also responsibility of politicians and companies to develop these industrial composting facilities in order to properly treat that plastic that is coming from biological sources. We have to put things easy to the final consumer. The consumer doesn't have to know about the materials. You know, it doesn't have to be an expert. Municipalities have to take care of that and tell, you know, to the consumer, if you are using this product, just put it in here because we are going to take care of it. Alejandro, uh, that's a fantastic place to end. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you, Dan. That is Alejandro Gallego Schmidt there. We'll post a link to the story he wrote about his work in the show notes. Sticking with the environment theme, to end this week's episode, we've got some recommended reading from Nicole Hashem, environment and energy editor at The Conversation in Australia. Hi, this is Nicole Hashem. I'm the environment and energy editor for The Conversation based in Canberra, Australia. As the COP26 negotiations gear up, the stories I'm recommending are perhaps unsurprisingly both related to climate change, one in the Australian context and one very much global. The first focus is on the announcement by Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison of our new pledge to reach net zero emissions by 2050. It's written by Frank Yotso from the Australian National University. So at the last minute, just days before COP26, Morrison finally announced Australia would adopt the 2050 target. But as Yotso tells us, Morrison gave very little detail on how his government would meet the pledge. And Australia is still refusing to increase its 2030 target that would really spur emission cuts over the next decade. So at COP26, we can expect other nations will quite rightly argue that Australia is still not doing enough on climate change. 
My second recommendation looks at some really alarming news on the global carbon budget. New analysis by a consortium of scientists from around the world shows that global emissions from the burning of fossil fuels are set to approach pre-pandemic levels by the end of this year. The piece is by Pep Canadell from Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO. He tells us that while COVID-19 caused an unprecedented drop in emissions, levels in China and India are already higher than they were before the pandemic, and the rest of the world is catching up pretty fast. Most concerningly is that global emissions are still not tracking towards net zero by 2050. So there's some pretty clear evidence there that we need a really strong outcome at COP26 if we want to keep global warming in check. That's all from me. Thanks for listening. Nicole Hashem there in Canberra. That's it for this week. Thank you to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode. And thanks to the conversation editors, Ozia Patel, Moina Spooner, Julius Miner, Imogen Malpass and Stephen Kahn, and to Alice Mason for our social media promotion. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us, podcast at theconversation.com. And don't forget, to sign up for our free daily email. Just click the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying The Conversation Weekly, please leave a rating or review wherever podcast apps allow you to. And tell your friends and family about the show as well. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sol. I'm Dan Marino. Thanks for listening. <laughs>